101. Welcome everybody to the GMAT 101. My name is Reed Arnold. I will be your host through the wonderful world of the GMAT. To those of you that are here live, good to see you. To those of you that are watching this recording, welcome. Hope you get something out of this. Uh, today we're going to just kind of go over the basics of what the GMAT is, how it works, how it's scored, um, a little bit about kind of the psychology and what the test is really testing. And there'll be uh, hopefully 10, 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions um, for those of you that are here. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in. And actually, we're going to start with a two minute kind of warm up GMAT problem from the official GMAT problem set. So this is a, a question made by the test makers. And let's just give it a roll. Take two minutes. Go ahead and give this one a swing. Fifteen more seconds. All right, so that is two minutes. That is the average time you have for a problem solving question on the test. Uh, we're not going to do a whole lot of, of, of problems tonight. That's not really the purpose of the session, but we, we do want to give you kind of a little taste of how this works and also show that while this test in many ways will at first glance look like a test you've taken before, for instance, the SAT or the ACT, if you were applying to college in the United States um, or other standardized tests, right? This looks like a kind of standard math problem you might've had in math class and you can answer it that way. If you want to answer this one like math class, you can. You can say, okay, I have two times 14,000 plus one times 16,000 plus three times 17,000. And then I add that up and then I divide by six. Should have specified up front though, you don't get a calculator for this. So you have to do all this on pen and paper in this section. And then that'll be the average, right? You could do this classroom math. But you should know that the test, while it uses problems that look like classroom math and that while classroom math can work on many problems, it's not really a classroom math test. Uh, in fact, it's much more a test of your reasoning skills, both verbal, logical, or quantitative reasoning skills, executive reasoning as well, executive functioning, than it is, can you just do arithmetic, right? The test knows you have a calculator. You can answer this with a calculator in day to day life, who cares? Um, so while the classroom math works, there are other there are often other ways to get through a problem uh, without classroom math. And I tell my students in my classes that if your work looks like something you would have done in a classroom, keep working on that problem and find a different way because there's probably a better way to solve it. Okay, so let's think about this. When we had here two workers who made fourteen thousand, one worker that made sixteen thousand, and then three that made seventeen thousand. And I'm asked to average these up. So I don't want you to calculate the average. I want you to think about the average. 
want you to look at these numbers and just think about what you could figure out about where the average of these numbers is going to be. Right, I'm noticing here, okay, well, there's nothing at 15,000. That's maybe kind of interesting. What do we know about this average? And what does an average really tell us? It's not the most common number in the set. It's not the middle of the set even, that's the median. The average is the number that every number would be if it were the same in a set, or sometimes I also tell my students to think of it as the place the set balances. Okay, it's the number at which the set balances. And I'm noticing there's a lot of numbers over here. And these two 14,000s are, are kind of left behind. So I really feel like the balance is towards this way in the set. It's going to be closer to 16 or 17. And in fact, I could almost, now that I'm thinking about this here, what if this were 14? I hadn't thought of this when I was doing the question, but if this were 14,000, we'd actually have three at 14 and three at 17. And then the balance would be right in the middle. The balance would be 15 and a half. Okay, but that 16,000 actually is more than 14, obviously. So it pulls the average above 15 and a half. So it's not gonna be A or B. Now, is it gonna be as high to get to 16? Right, that's the next question. Um, will we actually get to 16,000? Um, and I don't think we will. And one way we can think about that is each of these 17,000s are 1,000 above 16. And these two 14,000s are two less than 16. And so I'm actually, if I have minus four over here and plus three over here, I have too much downward pressure to get to 16. So I know it's not D or E. Okay, so it has to be C. So I did a little arithmetic. I did one times three and I did 17 minus 16 times three and 16 minus 14 times two. I guess I did a little arithmetic, but it's certainly easier than the arithmetic I would have had to do to do this the classroom way. But by thinking about averages as a balance, you can get to an answer without actually doing all the heinous classroom math you might be used to doing. And that's very common on this test. And that's often what this test is, is seeing is, can you just step back and think about the big picture enough to narrow down between the possible answers as opposed to just grinding through the math you grew up doing. I'd still do the math I grew up doing, right? Sometimes in the middle of the test, I can't think of everything. I just, all, all I see is the classroom. But when I'm studying, I try to find other ways of getting through a problem. And it's worth studying with that in mind. So we're gonna talk about what's on the test, how it's scored and how to get the most out of your preparation, knowing already that this test is maybe different from some of the tests we've prepared for. First off, some just basic data about this test. And by the way, I I'm, I'm need to say this up front, actually. Goodness gracious, GMAT 101. It's important to know that this is for the GMAT Focus Edition. The GMAT Focus, which is the new version of the GMAT, the GMAT Classic, I don't know what we call it anymore. It actually retired at the end of January. There was a time where you could take either, but now, the GMAT Classic is gone. The GMAT Focus is the only test available. And actually come July, the GMAT Focus, they're just going to start calling the GMAT again. Okay. So there's no, for, for everyone here and for those watching the recording, this is for the newest version of the test. A lot of similarities to the old test. Definitely a few differences. We're going to lay out uh, how this test works tonight. So uh, any GMAT you take, the score is valid for five years. You do have to wait 16 days between taking a test, whether you do it online or in person. You can do it online or in person. The GMAT online is a little bit more expensive. You can take the GMAT five times in a 12 month period. That's not quite the same thing as saying five times in a year, right? It's not, if I take, for instance, if I take the, the GMAT five times in, uh, from from April to December of 2024, when January of 25 comes around, I can't take it again because that's still within 12 months of the last time I 
or the test five times ago, right? So it's take take the last 12 months from today. If you've taken the test five times, you can't take it again until tomorrow, I guess is the basic, basic timeline. Um, the scoring scale is from 205 to 805. That looks very similar to the old scoring scale of 200 to 800, uh, but just know that they actually are somewhat different. The, the 705 is not the same as the 700. The 555 is not the same as the 550. There are, there's a little bit difference in how the, the, what the numbers mean. At the top, for instance, the top 20 business schools, right? You used to see that the average was like 710 to 730. The average with the new scores is about 645 to 695. Okay, so different numbers that, that mean the same thing. Uh, you do have the calculator in the data insights section. We're gonna go over the sections here shortly, but you do not get one on the quant, as I mentioned previously. A new change to this version of the test, you get to change answers, up to three answers a section, which is different. It used to be you could not change answers. You get your test, you get your results immediately, no matter which version of the test you take. And business schools will look at your highest score. You get to choose which test to, to send, but unfortunately you can't super score, right? So if you got a higher score on the quant one day and a higher score on the verbal one day, you can't bring those together. It's just the highest overall score is the one the business schools are going to look at. And that is how they will treat you. Okay, they will treat you by the highest score. They have every incentive to do so. You register at www.mba.com. So the GMAT has three sections, the quant, the verbal, and the data insights. The quant has questions like what we just saw. They're called problem solving. You're gonna get 21 of those problems in 45 minutes. So it's a little bit more than two minute average per question. The, verb, oh, the score in each section is 60 to 90. I, again, I don't know where these numbers come from. I don't know why they chose 60 to 90, uh, but that is a, the range of each section. Actually, let's talk about this now. It's important to know though, let's show this slide here, that those numbers don't quite mean the same thing in each section. So for instance, in the quants section, an 86 is the 92nd percentile, uh, which is a very strong score. In the verbal section, an 86 is the 98th percentile. Okay, so it's it's the same number, and on the data insights, it's the 99th percentile, right? So you can get the same number, but it actually corresponds to a you know higher percentile across the sections, and the average is different in all of them, right? The average in the data insights is 74. On the verbal, a 74 is 14th percentile. That's a pretty low verbal score, all things considered. On the data insights, it's the average verbal score. Okay, so those numbers don't mean the same thing across the sections. Uh, that verbal section is 45 minutes for 23 problems. The 23 problems are critical reasoning and reading comprehension passages. Again, your scores from 60 to 90 and data insights, 45 minutes for 20 problems. This is a, a, the biggest shakeup to the test. This has data sufficiency questions, which is a GMS specific kind of problem. And then questions that deal with tables or graphs. Uh, we call it multi-source reasoning. That's where they give you a few tabs to look at that could be like emails from a boss to an employee and then from the employee to the boss, or it could be an email and then like a diagram. Um, it's kind of a lot of freedom in what can show up in a multi-source reasoning, but the point is that there are multiple sources to consult. And then there are two-part questions, which basically just ask a question where you have to choose two answers at once to get a correct answer on that problem and you were scored from 60 to 90 on that pro on the data insights. Those three sections combine to give you the final score of 205 to 805. Uh, each section is equally weighted in determining your score. Okay, so it's not like one of them is worth more or worth less. They are each, a, they each determine a third of your score. Whether you take the test at a test center or online is very much up to your personal preference. Um, I kind of prefer to go to the center to know that I'm going for that reason. You know, I'm going to play that game. Uh, if I'm home, I find myself distracted. You know, it's kind of familiar territory. I want to go to the kitchen and get a snack or you know, jump to the other room and watch TV rather than being here. So some people have different mindsets. 
in either version of the test, you get to choose the order in which you take these three sections and you get to choose where your break is. You get one 10 minute break. You can do it after the first section or after the second section, regardless of the order you take the sections in. And you should use that 10 minute break. Give your brain a rest. Brains need breaks. Uh, for scratch paper, if you take it at the center, they give you a laminate yellow pad with a marker. Uh, and and it, when I say that, it, it writes pretty fine. It's a pretty nice marker. I don't think it's going to be like a smudgy uh, expo marker or anything. It's pretty, pretty nice. Um, and you can change it out in between sections if you need to. If you take it at home, you provide your own whiteboard. There is an online whiteboard, although most students prefer not to use that. You can prefer, bring your own marker board, and that probably will be an expo marker that you can erase in between problems. Your score reports get... Uh, um, Cost includes five score reports. Additional reports are available for free. Uh, your co the, the cost of the test includes five score reports. I'm trying to decide what that means. Forgive me if I... Um, I think that must mean the quant verbal data insights overall. I'm not sure what the fifth report would be. So forgive me, I'm not sure what that fifth report is gonna be, but I think it means the sectional scores and the overall score. Um, it might give you some other demarcated score of some kind. Uh, then you can pay for like a more detailed, more uh, data rich score report that you can drill down like, you know, into question topic and question type. It'll give you a little more information than the regular scores. Again, five times in 12 month period and you have to wait 16 days between tests. Um, any questions so far? kind of the sections and rules of this test. Okay, let's get into how this test is scored because this is where things get really, really fun. Every test you've taken in your life is scored a similar way. You do the problems, everyone else does the problems, often the same problems. I guess the SAT started to mix stuff up to some degree, but still, even when you had different SATs, other people had the same SAT somewhere. And what they would do is they would look at the people who had the same SAT. They would count up how many questions people got right and people who got more questions right got higher scores and people who got less questions right got worse scores. And that's kind of how it worked. Uh, the GMAT is drastically different from this grading system. It is a computer adaptive test, which means it adapts to you as you take it. The rough way of thinking about this is that if you get a question right, you're going to get a harder question. If you get a question wrong, you're going to get an easier question. That is simplified. That's not exactly how the algorithm works, but it's close enough to accurate that that's what you can think of when you're taking the test. But what that means is that two test takers can get a very different batch of questions, right? Because it's adapting to each individual test taker as they go. So let's look at these two test takers during a section here, student one and student two. And student one, we can see, got to you know the highest difficulties that the test offers and got some of those questions right. Didn't you know finish strong, kind of had a dive on difficulty at the end, but definitely got to those highest sections. Student two, you know, didn't. Student two stayed below this difficulty for the entire test, only saw two questions there and missed them both. So the question I have for you is if you were in charge of the GMAT, if you were the GMAT regent, and you got to choose who got the higher score. Would you say student one? Would you say student two? Or would you maybe say it's a tie? You know, you might say like, well, it looks like their average is kind of the same. So you can call it a tie. Um, so just take a second and there's no right answer. This is just kind of your predilection, right? Which do you which do you value? The person who showed that they can get the hardest questions right? The person that maybe stayed a little more consistent or does it average out based on their overall performance? Just take a second to think about that. Now I'm going to mix up the question for you. If instead of a GMAT score, this was the value of a stock portfolio over time, who gets the higher score? And that is an easy question. There's no ambiguity there. Everyone agrees in that situation that student two gets the higher score. And that's how the test works. You know, on the GMAT, student two gets the higher score. Okay, Student one gets a lower score, even though... They got a lot of these questions right, and they were very hard questions. 
So why? Why would that happen? Well, first off, I want you to think about what might have happened to student one. Why did they see this nosedive in the back half of a section? Could be that they ran out of energy, right? But most likely, they ran out of time. Most likely, those hard questions that they got right ate up the clock, and it is a timed test. And at the end of the section, they didn't have time to answer questions as well, so they couldn't. So they kind of started guessing and guessing and moving faster and faster, and their score tanked. One thing this test is testing is your ability to decide what is worth your attention and what is not. It's an executive functioning test as much as it is a quantitative reasoning test. And it's not worth your time to get sucked into a hard question, even if you end up getting it right, if it's going to later on cost you an easier question. That's like, you know, taking a big risky investment that doesn't have a lot of return and then missing the easy investment that had a big return. That's a bad investment choice to go for the risky one with small return over the, the easy one with big return. And it is just a fact of this test that uh, you get way more punished. I'm actually going to write this out because I think it's so important. You get way more punished for missing an easier question. Then you get rewarded for getting a harder question right. Some teachers use the analogy of like nickels, dollars, and $10 bills. The hard questions are nickels. Nice to pick up a nickel, all things equal, right? If I, well, everything's equal, I'd rather have a nickel than not. But if picking up a nickel is going to make me miss a $10 bill, I've made a bad decision. I've missed a $10 bill. Okay, this first and foremost, your goal is to pick up $10 bills. And student one did not allocate their resource, their time resource wisely. And student two, yeah, didn't get those hardest questions, but stayed pretty consistent and didn't miss easy questions either and ended up at a higher place. That's how this test works. And that's very unusual. That's not how most tests work. And it takes a real shift in mindset. So, because uh, consider these two students here, different student one and student two during a section. Look at their performance, look at their tra trajectory, look at the scores they got. Student one got the higher score, not because student one had more questions right. They both miss about half of the questions, but student one gets a higher score because the ones that student one missed were harder, or the ones that student one, two missed were easier. Student two missed easier questions than student one missed. So student one gets a higher score, but student one still missed a lot of questions. And another thing to note about these two students is that it felt difficult for both of them. Because this test adapts to you, it's going to feel hard, even if you're scoring higher. The way you feel the first day you take the test is kind of the way you feel every time you take the test. You just kind of learn to be a, a masochist about it. You just laugh at the question that makes you want to throw up and you make a guess and you move on. Because that's always going to happen. Getting used to that is a big part of GMAT prep. So how does one improve? What does improvement look like? Well, you're moving up the range of difficulty you see. You're not getting more questions right on a test. And in fact, sometimes I should say this, we have seen students, not only do these two students miss about the same amount, we've seen students who miss quite a bit fewer questions on the official GMAT. We've seen students miss not that many questions compared to someone else and get a much lower score because the ones they missed evidently were much easier. And those few easy misses hurt their score more than someone else's more harder misses. So it's really not about the number correct. So when you're taking tests, it's not that you're trying to get more correct, it's just your range of difficulties moving up, right? Today you are starting out your studying on this. If you take a practice test today, Right, the blue is kind of the middle of the is is the the middle of the questions you're able to get right difficulty wise. As you get better, your range moves up. 
and you get a higher score. Notice what that means though. You're not just making sure that the questions that are harder for you, you get right. You're making sure that the questions that are medium for you are easy. And in fact, the ones that are easy for you today, eventually, hopefully you get so good, you don't even see those anymore. It's a very mean test. You get so good at certain things that you actually don't get to do them on the test. That's just how it works. They don't even give you, it's like, we know you're gonna get that right. So we're not gonna show you that. Things that keep a score down, missing questions you shouldn't miss. You can do it once or twice and recover, but if you do it four, five, six times, you're going to see a score that's lower than what you're capable of getting. You're going to keep your score afloat by not missing questions you should get, not by getting really hard questions. Again, those are cherries on top. Another thing that really hurts a score is not finishing a section. Leaving questions blank. One is, you know, it's okay. Two, three, four, five, now you're seeing a big hit. If you leave questions blank at the end, it hurts your score more than missing them. So make sure you finish the section. And it's really common to see students not finish a section, even well into their studies. I tell my students, you have only one goal taking the test, and that's to use your time wisely. Your abilities what you're gonna score, every time you sit down, this is an unpleasant truth about the test, but every time you sit down, there's kind of a score you just have to accept. You don't know what it is maybe, but like there's a score you're not gonna beat. To some degree, it's already determined what your ceiling is on that day. So you're not trying to beat it. Uh, you just kind of accept that it's going to work out how it's gonna work out as long as you make good timing decisions. That's your only goal, make good timing decisions. Don't end up in this situation. Because then not only will you not get your high score, you'll get a score much less than the one you should get. So you really have to change your mindset when you're studying for this test. You don't study with the hope that you're going to take the test and get everything right. It ain't going to happen. You know, you need to know that you're going to get questions wrong. You need to know that you're probably not going to have a lot of time. You can go back and change three section, three questions if you have time to do it, but frankly, you might not, and that's okay. It's pretty hard to finish early. You're probably gonna, you know, answer the last question with not much time left. That's expected. You're gonna have to guess on some questions, guess the letter and move on. Don't study in the hopes that like, I'm never gonna have to do that. Yes, you will, don't lie to me. I do it and I've done this for a decade. You know, don't study for the textbook way. Look for other ways and build a toolkit of strategies that you can draw for different questions. Okay. So it's a very unusual test. You learn to love it. It's a very interesting test. Uh, but, but it does require kind of a, a fundamental shift in, in how you have taken tests before. Now let's get into how to study, how to get the most out of your preparation. That's what is the test, how it's scored, and how to get the most out of your prep. Common question, how long do I need to study? There's no real answer to that, I'm afraid. You know, I've had students do this in a month. That's pretty rare. I've had students do it in three months. That's still rare, but it happens. I've Most common is, you know, five or six months. I've seen students study for over a year. You know, I've, 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 I've seen a lot. Uh, it really depends on where you're starting, where you're trying to get to, and a myriad of other factors that are outside of your and my control. But if I had to kind of give a rough guesstimate of a timeline, there's kind of the, this says two to three months prep here, and then, you know, basically another month of review, like two to three months to really build up your foundations, and then another month of, reviewing it to lock it in before you take a first exam. And by the way, we just basically expect people to take two exams. Most, I think most, I don't have the data. So I, I'm maybe I should be cautious of the word most. A whole lot of my students take the GMAT more than once. And I want to say most, but I just can't verify that. 
right? So really it's another month of study, then 16 more days or more of review, and then another day. So this is really a, you know, three to five month plan. Timeline two is a little longer, especially if you don't have like, and this is also notice 10 to 15 hours a week. That's not nothing, especially if you're working full time. That's a lot of time out of your week to devote to this. If you don't have 10 to 15 hours a week, you need to plan on a longer run runway. If your score increase needs to be higher, you need to plan on a longer runway, right? Three to five months, then an additional one to two. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is getting for a four to seven month study plan. And I think timeline two is more common for most students, if I'm being honest. If you need to do it in crunch time, I've seen it done. You know, I've seen it done, but it just, it's demanding and stressful. And if you can give yourself the grace of a long runway, I, I, Highly recommend it. So some common or some, some important lessons on how improvement happens on this test. Um, it's really important that you study well. In fact, I tell my students that there are, you know, four ways, four ways to get an uncommon score on this test. One of the things I often do with my first class is I ask, who wants to get a top 10% score? And most of my students do. Some people are fine with top 20%, but even that's, you know, one in five. Top 10% is one in 10. And so if I have 20 people in a class, that's two people. If it's just a random sample, you know, two people are going to get the score they want if it's just blind random. Um, these are, un if you're going for that uncommon score, that top 10% score, as far as I can tell, there's 10 ways, there's four ways to do it. One is you come to the test with um, uncommon ability for whatever reason. For whatever reason, you just come to the test and you're already kind of good at what it's doing. My benchmark for that, and this is just my gut, um, are you in the top 75% or not? Without much work. So if you score in the top quarter and you haven't done hardly any studying, then yeah, okay, you're coming to this test unusually strong. OK, uh, you have an unusually long study time. Right. We saw five to seven months is fairly normal. So can you go longer than seven months? Um, an unusually dense study time. We saw 10 to 15 hours a week. Can you go 15 to 20 hours a week or more? Without going absolutely crazy, because that's not good for brains either. <laughs> you know, if you're just going nuts, doing GMAT all the time, that's not helpful either. None of these can I help you with. I can't help you come to the test with uncommon ability. I can't help you have a long runway or a dense study period. The only thing I can help you with is, is that you study unusually well. This is where Manhattan Prep shines. This is what we can help you with. But I want to be clear. There's still a lot of work you have to do to study unusually well. Reading all the manuals and doing a bunch of problems. I'm not saying that won't help. You might see a score improvement there. And yeah, for some people, it is enough. You know, but most people, that's the bare minimum. You have to be really thoughtful about how you study. And so here are just some tips for you on how to really learn this thing. Doing a question, right, and doing a problem doesn't make you better. You get better by analyzing the problem and diagnosing what you need to learn from that problem. That's your goal when you do a problem for homework is so that you can then look at, okay, what did I do? Was it efficient? Was it organized? Was it logical? Did I misread something? Did I uh, could a habit have helped me from making a careless error? Did I know what I needed to know? Did I use the most efficient strategy? What other strategies could I have used? Right, really analyze the problem and your work on it as much as you can to figure out what you need to learn from that problem. We'll talk in a second, but the most common study approach is to do a problem, check the answer, read the explanation and say, that makes sense. And then maybe you try to copy the exact solution from the explanation and then you move to the next problem. That is not unusual. 
Okay, we're going to talk about how to use explanations in a second, but just reading an explanation is not analyzing and diagnosing for yourself what you need to improve. Spaced repetition. Right? Don't do what we call the Sunday slog, or it's Sunday, so you do nine hours of GMAT prep. Do a little bit at a time more frequently. Find time in the middle of your day. Just you know, do a problem at lunch or in between emails. Just pull out a little GMAT problem and do it. Okay, put your brain on the test. That's going to be better than doing one long slog a, uh, a week. Testing is the most uh, effective way of studying. The most it should be effective, I suspect, not effect. That doesn't mean necessarily take a practice test. Because again, actually, by taking a practice test, you get better at the endurance of the test, but not actually the doing of the test. You have to analyze the test to really get better at it. Um, but by testing, we mean give yourself quizzes. Don't just read a book and move on. Uh, read a book and then the next day, without looking at the books, write down what you remember. What can you remember from reading that chapter? Is it nothing? Well, that stinks. Read it again. <laughs> do this, you know, do that again the day after. Pull up questions you know you've struggled on before. Ask yourself, what did I struggle on? What did I miss on this question? Why did I miss it? What would have helped me get it right in time? You want to build your recall ability and testing uh testing yourself on things you've done before is how you build recall flashcards when so one way we talk about uh studying is building when i see on one side of a flashcard like when i see something i will think or do something Just build a lot of prompts for these. And that can, this can be really, you know, when I see variables in the answer choices, I will choose my own numbers and answer the question. That's just a strategy you can use for those kinds of problems. But it can also be like when I see um, remainder, like remainder of X, when divided by y, whatever x and y are, I think this number is x more than a multiple of y. You can talk that away or not. That's just something that helps me deal with remainder questions, reconceptualizing it to mean that thing. Specify these for yourself. And last but not least, as I said, you can't just go crazy. Get your rest. Okay, don't study all the time every day without break. Get some rest and physical activity and social activity. I, sh I would add that, uh, but it's too late. Uh, some, some you know, physical activity, walking, running, jogging, whatever it is. Sports, games. Moving is good for brains, long story short. Moving is good for brains. Lots of studies have shown that. Staying in a library or your room all day studying, not so good for learning. Get up, move, get some fresh air. And then socialize, also good for brains, okay? Studying does require sacrifice. You might not see your friends as much as you usually want to. You might not work out as much as you want to, perhaps, depending on how much you work out currently. Uh, but don't abandon these things entirely. You can't go nuts studying this thing. Break old school habits, right? Don't just review the ones you miss. Review the ones you get right. Make sure you got them right for good reasons. Make sure you found an efficient way through it. Could you get it right faster? Could you get it right with an easier strategy? And don't just read an explanation to see if it makes sense and then try to do the same solution of the explanation. You want to use the explanations as hints. Use the explanation as a um, chance to get a thought you haven't had yet. And as soon as you get that thought, stop reading the explanation and go to the problem and see how far it takes you. 
understand why that thought might come up from this question. Why might someone have this thought and then see where you can go with it. Make yourself generate the process as much as you can that gets through the problem. Even if it's going to take you 10 minutes, right? This is when you're reviewing the problem. You've already chosen an answer. Now there's no clock anymore. Make yourself fight through the reasoning. And then if you get stuck again, you go to the explanation until you get a new hint, a new thought. You stop reading, go back and work. Make yourself lift that weight. This will help build uh, knowledge that you can recall and use to solve the problems that are given. Okay. Because um, it's very easy to read a question, right? The most common thing is to read an, an explanation and say, well, that makes sense. Right. Yeah, you un that means I understand this. Yeah, you do. But do you understand it? And have you have you wrestled with it enough so that you can recall it when you need to on a different problem? Your understanding now in the moment will not last more than a few hours, frankly. Brains start deleting information as soon as they have the chance to. You have to make yourself bring it back and, and lock it in. And as I'm emphasizing, reviewing is huge. You should spend twice as long reviewing problems as you spent doing it, doing them. And you're trying to diagnose and find takeaways that you can carry moving forward. Okay. Figure out what it was that caused you to miss the question or to make made it take a long time. Figure out what you need to correct. What would someone do to fix this issue? If it's a careless mistake, it's a habit. Careless mistakes are fixed by habit. The annoying thing about careless mistakes is that, and the habits that you need to develop, the problem is, is you only make a careless mistake sometimes. Even if you do it a lot, you know, a, a common careless mistake happens 20% of the time. That's one in five times that you do, you know, one in five problems. Um, that's very common. Most times, most careless mistakes that students make, they do like one in 20 problems. One in 10, one in 20, even one in 50, right? It's not that common, but it's going to hit you on the test. So you have to develop a habit to correct that careless error, even though most of the time you don't need the habit, but you need it for the few times you need it and it will save you points. And then the big question is, is it, you know, is this question even worth my time? If I miss it and it took a long time, should I even be doing this question? Should I just guess and get out of there for sooner? tuck it away for later when my scores jumped a few points because I'm now getting the questions right that I was missing. Again, before you jump to an explanation, analyze blind, right? What did you do? How confident are you? What felt good about the question? What didn't? Did you understand it? What don't you understand? What would you need? What do you need to reread and wrestle with? You can do some research, read up on the topic that's being tested. If you have another idea, another approach to the problem, try it without going to an explanation. See how far you can get. You should spend more time on the one you miss, yes, but again, review the right ones as well. Look at strategies. Explanations are hints. Okay. Um, open books, this is going to get a little, I've kind of already touched on some of these, right? Um, series of hints, I mentioned that. Okay, does just the solution, I didn't mention this. Sometimes just look at the answer. Don't even read the explanation yet, just look at the answer. Go back and see if that unlocks anything. It's, it's amazing how often it will. and find takeaways. We call it knowing the code. Here's that will, when I see, I think, call and response. This comes with experience, right? When you first start off, it's gonna be a little bit tougher to do this, but over time you wanna start really recognizing, okay, I see this a lot. When I see it, I do this, right? When I see S times T is positive, that means that they have the same sign. If S times T is negative, that means that they have opposite sign. If a question says uh, in verbals, what can I infer or what's likely to be true or what can be concluded? 
That's an inference question. That means I'm not looking to find the exact language in the passage. I'm looking to use language in the passage to prove logically that that thing must be true. So I'm not looking for the exact answer, but I'm looking for something that I can use to imply the answer with reasoning. Build that habit. Okay. Um, and that is, I think, the bulk of the lesson today. So now I have we have about 10 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, just for the sake of this recording, if the questions are kind of more um, personal or uh, you know less less broad for the too narrow for kind of a Gmail 101, I'm happy to answer those to, uh, answer those questions for those that are here. But uh, we'll save them for after I turn off the recording. But for those of you that are here, are there any questions I can answer about you know just broad how the GMAT works stuff or how Manhattan Prep can help you? All right. Not seeing too many questions, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, before I do that, just know that you can get the free starter kit from Manhattan Prep at manhattanprep.com. I didn't mention the GRE too much tonight, but we do GRE prep as well. Okay, um, Some similarities between the two tests, some differences, but you can try that out in a starter kit uh, as well as the GMAT or the executive assessment, which is another version of the GMAT test. Um, use this code for 10% off. at least for now, it's valid through December 31st, 2024. And all our student services is waiting. If you have any questions, they're always standing by eager to help. All right, so we hope to see you out. And until we do, best of luck in your studies. Thanks so much.